two decades, written a number of books, both on American domestic and foreign policy. And he is also quite a Renaissance man, having written a children's book and is a published poet. And I would say one of the most creative minds that I have known uh, in, in Washington. Now, Michael's piece today is called The Promise of American Nationalism. And in it, he proposes a sweeping revision of American foreign and domestic policy, focusing on trade, immigration, and our approach to the outside world. And with that, I'd like to ask Michael to speak for about 20 to 30 minutes and give us a pressy of his article and his thoughts on the foreign policy debate and domestic debate right now. Well, thank you, Jacob. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is a return for me, in a sense, to uh, the national interest, where it was my privilege to serve as executive editor a quarter century ago under Owen Harries at a time when, uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, the national interest, more than any other publication, I think, uh, was responsible for what, even now in hindsight, was one of the great debates of uh, American foreign policy history. The national interest uh, had a series of essays by people representing different potential strategies for the United States in the post-Cold War world, from Patrick Buchanan, a neo-isolationist strategy, uh, to Samuel P. Huntington, uh, arguing for American primacy, uh, and uh, Gene Kirkpatrick, uh, calling for the United States to become an ordinary country again. Uh, as it happens, and unfortunately, as I will argue, uh, the essay that turned out to be the most prescient, at least in terms of uh, outlining what would become the new consensus in U.S. foreign policy, was uh, by Charles Krauthammer and was published in Foreign Affairs in 1991, the unipolar moment, uh, where Krauthammer speaking uh, for what was then a wing of the neoconservatives. At the time, I considered myself a neoconservative, and there were a number of neoconservatives, including Kirkpatrick and Moynihan, who wanted a much uh, more uh, uh, a, a retrenchment in uh, U.S. foreign policy. But Krauthammer spoke for what has emerged as the dominant uh, uh, consensus in U.S. foreign policy. Uh, he argued that the United States, uh, at the end of the, the Cold War, was the sole superpower, uh, that uh, the U.S. had such enormous advantages compared to all other great powers in the world, uh, that it was ridiculous to act uh, uh, with excessive uh, restraint, uh, which was underestimating our own strength. And he uh, made an argument which uh, is repeated to this day by defenders of uh, American hegemony, which is the only alternative to the U.S. being uh, the sole superpower uh, with universal domination of the world, is uh, chaos and anarchy. Uh, it, it, it was, this became the consensus in the United States, not just because Charles Krauthammer wrote an article, but I would argue because a series of events uh, shifted elite consensus towards this position. The first was the Gulf War, uh, where what appeared to be a very easy, quick victory uh, gave a lot of Americans uh, what I think in retrospect was an exaggerated sense of uh, U.S. military power in being able to solve major uh, cr problems around the world. Uh, that, that sense of U.S. triumphalism was then underlined in the course of the Balkan Wars in the Clinton years, uh, which were also significant for bringing over much of the progressive political community to what had been uh, a kind of center-right or neoconservative uh, foreign policy position. Uh, Madeleine Albright famously asking uh, General Colin Powell why we have this military if we're not willing to use it in humanitarian interventions. Uh, and so by the end of the Clinton years, you had uh, what was clearly a new consensus uniting so-called neoliberal hawks, you know, humanitarian interventionists with, with the neoconservatives. Uh, and the realists, the uh, neo-isolationists, were essentially marginalized. So this, this was a new consensus, uh, and it has endured uh, until uh, recently. Now, the German philosopher Hegel says, the owl of Minerva flies at dusk, uh, which is a fancy classical way of saying that it is as a period is drawing to an end, that you can see what the actual shape of it is. Uh, I may be mistaken, but I think that the period of this particular consensus uh, 
uh, even if it's not uh, in, in, in the near future, uh, the end is in sight. And so looking back, we can describe this uh, consensus of the hege hegemonic strategy or the strategy of U.S. hegemony uh, as it evolved uh, and, and became shared by the foreign policy of elites of both parties in the late 1990s and in the 2000s. And I would argue that the hegemony strategy had two components. Uh, uh, there was a pattern of power and a system of uh, world order, uh, the hardware and the software, you might say, hard power and soft power. The geopolitical military strategy that underpinned it was U.S. hegemony. Now, now what do I mean by that? Uh, the United States fought World War I, World War II, and the Cold War uh, with the objective of preventing the emergence of a European or a Eurasian hegemon, that is a single hostile power or alliance of hostile powers, which would control the three significant regions of the Eurasian continent, Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia. Uh, the consensus, much to the surprise of many of us uh, uh, in the more realist camp, uh, but the consensus in Washington that emerged by the year 2000 was that the way to avert a hostile European or Eurasian hegemon was for the United States to become the Eurasian hegemon indefinitely. Uh, and to be the Eurasian hegemon, the United States had to be the hegemon in three regions. It had to be the hegemon of Europe, it had to be the uh, hegemon of the Middle East, and it had to be the hegemon of East Asia. Uh, so, and, and thereby it would pre preempt uh, uh, the formation of uh, any kind of hostile power, uh, but also it would prevent balance of power struggles within these three critical regions, which if, if they were left to fester would draw the United States in. Uh, and so the conversion of the U.S from one superpower in a bipolar world in which Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia were contested into the hegemon of Europe, the Middle East, and East Asia uh, took place uh, gradually as a result of various conflicts. Uh, the U.S. expanded into the vacuum made possible by the collapse of Soviet power in the Middle East with the Gulf War uh, and then uh, became even more deeply involved with the Iraq War and Afghanistan and Central Asia. I'll get to that in a, in a moment. Uh, in Europe, uh, although the presidency of uh, George Herbert Walker Bush had promised uh, Gorbachev as a condition for German reunification within NATO that the U.S. would not expand uh, NATO eastward, uh, the Clinton administration reneged on this promise and, and did so. Uh, and finally in Asia, the United States simply kept its Cold War alliances in place uh, with, with no practical plan for revising them or incorporating China into some kind of new regional order, although uh, China was invited to join the world economy. Uh, if, if there's a single statement of the uh, bipartisan hegemony strategy that sums it up, I think it would be uh, George W. Bush's speech at West Point in 2002 where he said, competition between great nations is inevitable, but armed conflict in our world is not. America has and intends to keep military strengths beyond challenge, making the destabilizing arms races of other eras pointless, and limiting rivalries to trade and other pursuits of peace. Uh, and, and if you parse this, what he's actually saying is that the United States will be unique in being the supreme military overlord of the world. Other great powers uh, voluntarily America hopes, will cede uh, the, the responsibility for attaining their security interests in their own regions to Washington, and they will specialize in uh, trade and other pursuits of peace. In, in effect, what this was doing was offering all of the rising and existing great powers in the world the deal which had been offered to uh, defeated Japan and West Germany after World War II. That is, in return for becoming U.S. military protectorates, uh, you can concentrate on trade and, and foreign markets within a rule-governed system uh, that is established and supported and, and policed by the United States. So that uh, to the extent that there was a logic to this strategy, and it wasn't simply a response to opportunistic exploitation of, of power vacuums after the Soviet decline, the idea was that the United States, as this kind of Hobbesian sovereign, would create a world in which 
really there would not need to be any other great powers because the United States would be doing the policing everywhere in every region. Uh, and the other great powers would be one-dimensional powers. They would be economic powers. Uh, and, and China's in, uh, incorporation uh, into the world order in this American view uh, would take place under these circumstances. It would be kind of a bigger version of, of Japan or of uh, first West Germany and then United Germany. Uh, the U.S. Uh, encouraged China to join the WTO to become integrated in the world economy. At the same time, the U.S. insisted on maintaining its Cold War era alliances and its uh, prerogatives as the dominant military power in East Asia. So that was the hard military underpinnings. The United States would conclude these three uh, 20th century struggles to prevent Eurasian hegemony by establishing Eurasian hegemony uh, for the indefinite future. Uh, the rules of world order uh, that it would uh, promote in recent years have been come to known as the liberal world order. And this term is bandied about as though there's some consensus about it. I think uh, the, the liberal world order in the sense in which the bipartisan U.S. foreign policy elite has used the term since uh, the 2000s began uh, actually is a fairly novel thing. It, it's not the old 1945 United Nations Charter world order. Uh, it, it's something new, uh, and it has two components. Th this is the new liberal world order, uh, if, if you want, instead of the old liberal world order. The new liberal order redefines sovereignty uh, and weakens it compared to the 1945 UN Charter, uh, which the UN Charter recognized basic human rights, uh, and it also made uh, genocide a crime of universal jurisdiction. But other than that, uh, uh, the, b both in practice and in theory, uh, uh, the United States accepted a high degree of sovereignty uh, for most of the other states in the world. Uh, and beginning more with the Europeans than the Americans in, in the early 21st century, the idea of the responsibility to protect justified uh, interventions by outside powers, uh, particularly in the United States, in countries which were not actually guilty of genocide. As I say, that has always been an exception to sovereignty in the UN Charter but for various lesser offenses, including uh, simply suppressing rebels, massacres, uh, ethnic cleansing, all of which are terrible things, uh, but which were seen as internal events for the most part in, in the uh, post-1945 era, but were now seen as proposed exceptions to the rule of sovereignty along with uh, actual genocide. The other part of the liberal world order, as, as it was pushed by Washington, uh, was a kind of economic liberalism which was much more thoroughgoing than anything that Washington had promoted after World War II. Uh, after 1945, the U.S. tried to create an integrated world economy so that you wouldn't have rival imperial blocs. Uh, and particularly among the industrial nations through the General Agreement on Trade and Tariff, uh, the U.S. Uh, led an effort successfully to uh, pretty much reduce or eliminate uh, tariffs on, on uh, exports and uh, Im imports. But what was called the Washington Consensus was much more radical in the 1990s and the 2000s. Uh, it required a, that all countries adopt a particular model of capitalism associated with uh, Reagan and Clinton America and with Thatcher's and Britain's, in uh, 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 Blair's Britain. Uh, you would have deregulation of finance. Uh, most forms of uh, uh, pro-industry support would be delegitimized, including tariffs. And most radical of all, you would have regulatory harmonization among countries. Uh, and, and that really digs deeply into basic domestic economic policy sovereignty. If your rules about how you treat your workers, how you treat the environment, consumer safety regulations are removed from national parliaments, and transferred to uh, an international legal regime. Uh, but that was the consensus uh, in, in the United States until re uh, recently, and I think among foreign policy leaders in both parties, that remains the, the consensus. Now, in practice, the Washington consensus uh, was observed more by the U.S. And, and a few other countries, including Britain, than by the other leading uh, industrial economies and, and America's major allies, uh, uh, Japan and Germany, particularly Japan, uh, which, like South Korea and Taiwan and other American uh, protectorates in East Asia, 
uh, have uh, followed a highly successful and fairly ruthless version of classic mercantilism and in industry promotion uh, uh, at the expense uh, of, uh, in some cases, the industries of their trading partners. But so that was, that was American, America's vision of hegemony. Uh, the U.S. would be the dominant military power in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. Uh, and it would promote a new world order uh, based on weakened sovereignty in, uh, in the name of human rights and, and uh, responsibility to protect, uh, and also a much more uh, thoroughgoing version of uh, economic liberalism than, than had earlier been the case. Now, skeptics throughout this uh, quarter century period, since this, this hegemony strategy coalesced, uh, and I'm one of them, uh, have thought it would, in, in the long run, it would fail for uh, three reasons. First, other powers, particularly other great powers or potential great powers, would reject U.S. hegemony in their regions. Second, the United States would not adequately resource its own strategy. And third, the U.S. public would rebel. All three of these have now come to pass in 2014. Uh, to begin with the rejection of U.S. hegemony in, in these uh, Eurasian uh, regions. Uh, it was clearly the plan of the architects of the Iraq and Afghan wars that Iraq and Afghanistan and perhaps some other Middle Eastern Central Asian states would become permanent bases for U.S. power projection in the way that Japan and South Korea have done in uh, East Asia. Uh, this was not to be. Uh, the United States so alienated the Iraqi people and the Afghan people uh, that there's some question as to whether uh, we'll remain in Af Afghanistan and under uh, what circumstances. Uh, and in Iraq, the refusal to do a status of forces agreements you know, has essentially led to, to U.S. departure. So this is an enormous blow to this project of establishing U.S. hegemony in the Middle East. Other blows include the increasing uh, independence from the U.S. of uh, Turkey, uh, and now Egypt, where advocates of uh, uh, American uh, uh, hegemony in the Middle East had initially welcomed uh, the democratic revolution in Tahrir Square. Uh, we now have an Egyptian strongman, General Sisi, who was recently elected by 93.3 percent of the vote, something that democratic politicians can only envy, uh, who was quoted in the New York Times as saying, and I quote, Sisi is suffering and torture. Uh, and the general uh, made uh, one of his first foreign policy trips before he became president uh, to meet with uh, Vladimir Putin in Russia. So, so U U.S. hegemony in the Middle East looks fairly insecure. Uh, in Europe, as we know from the news, Russia first pushed back against uh, the expansion of U.S. Uh, military force and influence in its uh, neighborhood with its short war in Georgia in 2008, and then in this year, 2014, uh, it's a seizure of Ukraine and fomenting of uh, trouble uh, in eastern Ukraine uh, shows that Russia is not satisfied with uh, U.S. hegemony in Europe. And in China, as, as we know from the news, uh, has been steadily pushing back uh, against uh, American power in its region, East Asia. So how, how does the hegemony uh, strategy stand now on the software, the rules of world order, all right, now that uh, the, the, the hard military underpinning of it is under assault or under question in the Middle East, in Europe, and in uh, East Asia? Uh, well, the liberal world order is not doing very well either. Uh, the so-called BRICS, uh, a useful but somewhat misleading term for uh, uh, rising powers of, of Brazil, Russia, India, and China, uh, are now associated with something which uh, liberal critics call sovereignism. That is, they're pushing back against the uh, North Atlantic democracy's idea uh, that sovereignty needs to be weakened. Um, uh, many of these countries are post-colonial countries, were formerly European colonies, and see this as a new form of uh, Western imperialism. The Washington consensus uh, is widely rejected uh, among developing countries, in, including Brazil, uh, and even India, under uh, its new premier Modi, uh, to read the Western press, you would think that he's like Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan and that this free market champion has come to power. Uh, in fact, uh, India will continue to be more statist and nationalist in many areas, uh, even if, if it's somewhat 
less uh, dirigiste than it was in, in the past. Uh, and finally, there's the possibility of anti-American balancing, something which uh, proponents of the hegemony strategy had dismissed a decade or two ago. But with uh, uh, the increasingly close alignment of Russia and China, uh, and even uh, India, who, whose premier was blacklisted uh, as a supporter of uh, uh, anti-Muslim riots and, and has vowed that he will not set foot in the U.S. except to attend uh, the United Nations. Uh, you do have the major population centers uh, and of the old world, uh, the two biggest countries, China and India, in terms of population, and the largest country in terms of geography, Russia, uh, alienated uh, from the United States, and it's very difficult to see American hegemony uh, uh, surviving that. Uh, finally, two other factors, inadequate resources. According uh, to projections of the results of the budget sequester that was recently agreed upon in Congress, U.S. defense spending will uh, go down to slightly more than 2% of GDP in the 2020s, which is probably adequate for uh, most of our actual uh, defense needs. Uh, but I would suggest it's woefully inadequate if you wish to be the Euro Eurasian hegemon in perpetuity. You would need to spend considerably more money. Finally, public support. The, the public rebelled uh, around 2004, 2005, 2006 against the costs of the Iraq and Afghan wars. That was a one of the main reasons for the return of the Democrats to power in Congress in 2008. Uh, Barack Obama became the Democratic nominee largely because, unlike Hillary Clinton, he had opposed uh, the Iraq war. And most recently, we've seen first the British public uh, and then the American Congress rebelled uh, preemptively against the idea of uh, deeper NATO military involvement in Syria. So uh, inertia counts for a lot in politics. And it will take some time to go from one uh, uh, paradigm and, and strategy to another. But I think that if this is not the beginning of the end for the uh, 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 hegemony strategy, at least we, we can begin to go back uh, to where we were at the end of the Cold War and, and discuss what would alternatives be like. Uh, I discussed that in my article for the National Interest. I won't go into detail except uh, to make a couple of points. The last time there was a real serious attempt by American leaders to think through what U.S. strategy would be in a multipolar world. Uh, I think was the Nixon administration. Now, you could argue the presidency of George Herbert Walker Bush envisioned something like this. But uh, uh, because of the loss of the election in 1992, it was never really developed. Uh, clearly, the second Bush you know, went in a quite different direction. Uh, so you really have to go back to uh, Richard Nixon, who said in an uh, interview with Time magazine in 1971, uh, I believe in a world in which the United States is powerful, I think it will be a safer world and better world if we have a strong, healthy United States, Europe, Soviet Union, China, Japan, each balancing the other, not playing one against the other in even balance. Now, thanks to the influence of the hegemony strategy, even in a democratic primary, any presidential candidate who said that the United States itself should be balanced by other great powers uh, would be considered you know, just beyond the scope of, of, of reasonable discussion. And yet this was the hawk, Richard Nixon, uh, in the 1970s. And what's more, he, Nixon arguably was in the mainstream tradition of 20th century American foreign policy. In his 1910 Nobel Prize lecture, Theodore Roosevelt said, it would be a masterstroke if those great powers honestly bent on peace would form a league of peace, not only to keep the peace among themselves, but to prevent, by force if necessary, it's being broken by others. This view was shared by uh, Woodrow Wilson, who is sometimes caricatured, uh, and he made many mistakes, uh, but, but the actual plan for the League of Nations was that there would be a great power uh, directorate or concert, uh, uh, that uh, it wasn't a, uh, a purely utopian experiment. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, if anything, was as, as much of a realist as his uh, cousin Theodore, uh, he mocked the Kellogg-Briand Pact of 1928 uh, that tried to outlaw war, uh, saying that, quote, war cannot be outlawed by resolution alone. Uh, 
1942, Roosevelt, who came up with the phrase United Nations, but didn't put a whole a lot of, of stock in the actual details of what became the UN World Organization. He left that to his Secretary of State, Cordell Hall. Uh, he, he envisioned a great power uh, concert with the regional hegemons uh, policing the world, uh, keeping the peace after the end of the war against Germany and Japan. He said the real decisions should be made by the United States, Great Britain, Russia, and China, who would be the powers for many years to come, and that would have to police the world. So in different ways, in different decades, what Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, and perhaps the first Bush shared in common was the assumption that if you want world peace, it has to be primarily peace among the great powers. Uh, and that means that their legitimate prerogatives as great powers, including their prerogatives in their own regions, will be recognized by the others, including the United States. Uh, so uh, it, it's a completely different perspective uh, from the bipartisan policy we have followed since the 1990s of trying to encircle and pin down uh, all of the great powers uh, in their own regions. I, I call it quadruple containment. Uh, the phrase is a development of the phrase dual containment from the Cold War. Uh, quadruple containment means that we contain our allies as well as our uh, enemies. Uh, if you look at four major powers, the two major powers of Europe, Germany and Russia, and the uh, two major powers of East Asia, Japan and China, we contain Germany and Japan by keeping them as militarily weak, dependent protectorates indefinitely. And at the same time, uh, we encircle the other powers in those regions, uh, Russia and China, uh, on their own borders. Uh, now, the problem with this strategy is, quite apart from their pushing back and, and uh, the unwillingness of the American people to pay for this, is it requires American leaders to engage in a Orwellian kind of newspeak so that uh, if any power anywhere in the world, no matter how remote from North America, objects to being encircled by American military forces or allies on its own borders, that power is guilty of aggression and trying to overturn the world order. Uh, this would have seemed crazy, I think, not only to Richard Nixon, but to FDR and TR and, and to most American statesmen through most of American history. So. I don't want to go on too long. We can have a conversation. Uh, just a, a few th final thoughts about beyond the, the hegemony strategy, and, and I developed this at more length in, in my uh, national interest essay, The Promise of American Nationalism. I think the, uh, the BRICs are going to win the debate about the rules of world order. That is, if we have not persuaded uh, China, India, Brazil, uh, Russia, you know, Ru Russia is a, a somewhat second-tier country, but, but you know, China and India, at any rate, are going to uh, uh, be two of the three major uh, nation states, along with the United States, in the 21st century. If we've not persuaded them to abandon uh, economic nationalism, and uh, we've not persuaded them to water down their sovereign claims and, and uh, claims uh, against foreign intervention then the fact that we've won over the support of members of the European Union is, you know, Europe is not the world. Uh, the North Atlantic is not the world in the 21st century. Uh, so, uh, and I think we should consider, if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, and in fact, much of the American public, and at least half of the American political spectrum, is on the side of the so-called BRICS when it comes to this new sovereignism. After the United States did not ratify the International Criminal Court, the Bush administration withdrew the U.S. The United States did not ratify the Law of the Sea Treaty. We are now in the somewhat Orwellian position of uh, denouncing China for not absorb, uh, observing the norms in the South China Sea of the Law of the Sea Treaty, which the American Congress rejected. So uh, in, in a way, backing away from the, the more extreme versions of what is being called the liberal world order is actually a return to America's practice. And I would argue uh, it's not a matter of liberal democracies versus authoritarian states. It's largely a matter of large populous countries, which tend to be the great economic and military powers, versus small countries. Small countries, including the United States, when it was uh, its very origins, have a much uh, deeper stake 
in a rule-governed world order than large countries do. And this is true even when it comes to uh, globalization. And I'll just end with a few remarks uh, about trade. Uh, the fact is, the countries that are the most dependent on the global economy are not the ones that prosper from it the most, the United States, uh, uh, Germany, and Japan. Uh, the larger the country is, in general, the smaller the share of its economy uh, that is involved in international trade. Whereas if you're a you know, Singapore or Finland, you have a much higher share, and you're much more dependent on foreign trade. Uh, when it comes to uh, multilateral regimes, uh, you can, if you're China, India, and, and the United States, uh, which according to most projections in the year 2050 uh, will be the three largest economies by GDP. A trilateral deal among them will open up more trade and investment uh, you know, than any kind of Doha round or anything like that where you have to line up dozens or hundreds of, of lesser states. So while it's the conventional wisdom uh, that we want a rules-based international trading system, the fact is a results-based system in which a few large economies, including the European Union, just cuts deals with each other, can accomplish a great deal of uh, economic integration uh, by less uh, involved uh, uh, bureaucratic means. Let me finish by uh, quoting uh, Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick, uh, whom I quote in my article. By the way, I, it was, it's my privilege to know uh, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick uh, fairly well. And one thing that she returned to again and again and again uh, was something she had learned from one of her mentors, uh, the political scientist at Yale, Harold Laswell. Uh, and uh, she often uh, repeated this, and I've never forgotten it. She said, when you're designing a constitution, imagine that your worst enemies are in power. Uh, and she applied this to rules for world order. Uh, and I, I think one of the things we've done is we've designed a constitution uh, that empowers the temporarily dominant nation, the United States, and we haven't thought about what this means for us uh, in the future when we may no longer have that position of uh, dominance. But, but what I want to quote is from uh, Kirkpatrick's fall 1990 article in The National Interest entitled, A Normal Country in a Normal Time. She wrote, the United States performed heroically in a time when heroism was required, altruistically during the long years when freedom was endangered. Uh, but she argued that it was now time for the U.S. to adapt to a multipolar world while focusing more on nation building at home. She said, with a return to normal times, we can again become a normal nation and take care of pressing problems of education, family, industry, and technology. We can be an independent nation in a world of independent nations. Thank you. Well, thank you. For anyone who's just tuning in, that was Michael Lind of the New America Foundation talking about his new article in the National Interest, The Promise of American Nationalism. And now I would like to ask anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question to, uh, to raise their hand and to identify themselves, please for our television audience as well. Jim. I, I'm Jim Pinkerton with Fox News. Hold on one second, I need to get you a microphone. Uh, Jim Pinkerton with Fox. Um, Mike, that was really, really interesting. I did not, however, hear very much about the Obama administration in, in, and where they fit in in this. And for, furthermore, it seems to me that while you're quite right about a quadruple containment being very ambitious, it seems to me that the Obama administration has made a, a quintuple co containment if you add carbon dioxide, which appears to be uh, among the most important domestic and international initiatives that, 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 that they have. In my view, the Obama administration continues the hegemony strategy that uh, was settled on as the consensus uh, in the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations. It has changed its uh, tactical and operational approach, but has not changed the strategy. So it, it has not questioned the basic premise that the U.S. will continue to be the military hegemon of Europe and of the Middle East and of East Asia. But because of the public backlash against the, the cost of the Iraq war, and also because of, of genuine uh, uh, concerns about the cost in blood and treasure, uh, it has tried to achieve what David uh, Kaleo, the international relations scholar in a different context once called hegemony on the cheap, 
so that we will continue uh, to intervene in the Middle East, but we will do so by sending drones uh, to extrajudicially assassinate criminal suspects rather than to invade countries and try to remake them. Uh, the United States will reaffirm its alliances in East Asia, the so-called uh, pivot to uh, the so-called pivot to Asia. Uh, but it will not offer China any vision of an integrated security system other than perpetual subordination to the United States in, in its own region. Uh, so, so I think it's a difference of tactics, and it's an important difference. But it's not a fundamental difference of uh, strategy. Uh, in, in terms of uh, carbon, uh, the, the Obama administration, I think, is following the lead of uh, Germany and, and some other industrial countries in thinking that uh, uh, the great economic challenge uh, is to promote rapid decarbonization of energy supplies uh, to avert the consequences of, uh, of global warming. Now, uh, at the same time, uh, if you look at the world outside of the North Atlantic democracies, uh, that this project is not being carried out uh, uh, by the countries th that would have to carry it out for it really to be effective, that is uh, uh, India and China uh, in particular. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, China has just signed the biggest trade deal in human history with uh, Russia to import natural gas, which many environmentalists are, are trying to prevent from being produced at all uh, by fracking uh, in, in the United States. Uh, you know, whatever one thinks about uh, uh, the severity and urgency of global warming, uh, it's clear that if you fairly rapidly moved to replace uh, coal as the source of uh, energy and electricity generation with uh, natural gas, uh, you, you would slash the amount of greenhouse gases, even though you would continue uh, to have, have some slower growth. Uh, so uh, it's also clear that if you really, really are serious about combating uh, global warming uh, as a result of uh, greenhouse gases, you would favor nuclear energy, which is expensive uh, in, in the initial investment, but once it's up and running, it's, it's much cheaper than renewable energy uh, sources uh, like hydro and, and solar power and wind power. So uh, it, it, I just kind of wonder about the logic of people who purport to want to decarbonize the energy mix of, of the global economy as quickly as possible, but reject uh, the, the two most practical ways of doing it, which is replacing coal with natural gas and with uh, ramping up nuclear energy. Ambassador Burt. Uh, I very much agree with, uh, with your uh, answer just now on uh, describing maybe the Obama administration strategy as, as fine-tuning uh, the uh, prevailing foreign policy strategy. But I want to raise the question and really maybe challenge you on the point you were making originally in your remarks, that maybe we're at a Hegelian moment and we're beginning to see this uh, consensus uh, collapse. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the, the Nixon-Kissinger period, and there, there I think uh, you're correct, that was a, but it was a pretty unique moment in the sense that, uh, that there were uh, real challenges at the end of the, uh, in the, in the course of the uh, Vietnam War, the protests here in, in, in the United States, a real sense that uh, the United States needed a new strategy and there was a willingness perhaps of a very experienced president with, with strong advisors around him to think about alternatives. And looking ahead, I just don't see that emerging in, in, in Washington. Uh, Jacob, you t called Michael uh, one of the most creative people in Washington, but you know, creativity in Washington <laughs> is sort of an oxymoron. And if I look ahead and look at, uh, you know, both Republican and presidential candidates for 2016, I don't see the likelihood of somebody necessarily challenging that consensus. So how realistic is it to, is it to, to argue or believe that we're likely, short of, a, of another kind of Iraq-style debacle, to see some, a, a, a new strategy emer emerge in the, in the near future? And I just just simply say it's just striking to me so soon after that Iraq experience and Afghanistan uh, 
that you have an administration that's pursuing the same strategy as you argue it is, that it's coming under real criticism from both parties as being too weak, uh, too prudent, and not strong enough. Well, you put your uh, finger on, on the basic uh, problem, which is it's very difficult for great powers to retrench for both external and domestic political reasons. Uh, uh, domestically, any retrenchment, no matter how prudent, will be attacked as weakness, particularly in a democracy. So democracies probably uh, have more difficulty uh, backing down carefully from overexposed positions than autocracies do. You can just you know, turn on a dime and who's going to question, you know, the, the uh, authoritarian government. Uh, but that is kind of a trap. Uh, uh, that is, uh, as I said, if, if a, a candidate in the Republican or Democratic presidential primaries used the kind of language about the U.S. in a multipolar world that those well-known hawks Richard Nixon and Theodore Roosevelt used, uh, they would be attacked, uh, either from within their own party or, or by the other party. Uh, and th and the, another concern, which does uh, bother me because I, I, I want the United States to uh, uh, be as secure and as respected as possible, is even if you're engaged in prudent retrenchment, will other countries view this as weakness? So even if you were overexposed in the first place, you know, how do you back down? Uh, so there, there's an enormous temptation simply to maintain the overexposed position uh, and you don't have to worry about sending signals of weakness to your opponents or being attacked at home. But the actual economic and political underpinnings of your power just are eroded and eroded and eroded. And essentially, you could argue this is what happened with Britain and France after World War II. You know, in, in the 70s, Britain was sending troops into, into you know, Yemen and, and the Persian Gulf. And uh, France is still sending troops to Mali. Uh, you know, at some point, someone needs to tap a country on the shoulder and say, well, maybe, you know, you should think about, you know, scaling back if, if not retiring. Uh, you know, but the, the concern would be that uh, you, you need to have an exit strategy. That's just the way I would put it. Uh, we needed an exit strategy from the Cold War in the 1990s at which we could point, we could say, Germany and Japan and South Korea are not going to be our protectorates for the next 100 years. And Russia and China, given you know the appropriate decisions on their part, can become, if not allies, at, at least uh, uh, other great powers, and that there will be some kind of system of order, which is not America's allies versus America's enemies with these tripwires drawn between them. Uh, we missed the opportunity to do that in the 1990s, and I'm, I don't know really how y you can do it at this point without it seeming weakness. If, if President George Herbert Walker Bush had proposed turning the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe into a larger structure and then gradually letting the Warsaw Pact and NATO dissolve, that would have been bargaining from a position of strength. If the next president proposes this, following Ukraine, following the South China Sea incidents, it would look like weakness on America's part. And, and uh, But having said that, that's the situation we are in. And I do think that the face-saving way to back down from what I do think is an overextended strategy is to propose some kind of regional security structures in which all regional powers and the United States as an extra regional power, if we have interests in, in these regions, and I think we do, can participate as respected equals instead of on a ally-enemy basis. And, and th you're quite right, this is, is still a completely provocative idea in Washington, and you're not going to hear it in 2016. Maybe you won't hear it in 2020. But at some point, I think we have to think of what is the exit strategy from this permanent Cold War alliance system, which has now gone on a generation after the Cold War. Mike Masetic, PBS NewsHour. Uh, you just alluded to this, but um, you're a fan of T.R., who's very much in the Hamilton School of Realism. T.R. was a great advocate of Mahan, whom you criticize. We have this situa specific situation now in the South China Sea, East China Sea, in which Beijing 
is extending its perimeter way, way beyond its borders. How specifically is the United States, if they stick to the principle of free navigation, open access, maritime access, how is the United States supposed to deal with this? Well, that's a very good question. I criticize uh, Mahan because I think that his view of world power as depending on control of sea lanes was already obsolete in, in his own period. Uh, uh, if you look at Leo Amory, who, who was a, a British strategist of that period, uh, in responding to uh, Halford Mackinder's theory of Eurasia being the center of everything, Amory famously said, uh, and I paraphrase from memory, it doesn't really matter where a country is located. The country that has the power of science and technology and engineering is going to be the leading military power. So my first response would be, if we're really going to have a rivalry with China, it's not going to be decided by whose navy controls which sea lanes. It's going to be decided by whose factories, whose credit system, whose infrastructure, whose R&D is more fundamental in the long run. Uh, particularly if, as seems likely, it would be a Cold War in which, just as during the, the Soviet-American Cold War, Yes, the Navy has to plan for these naval confrontations, but frankly, I don't, I don't think it's a, a great investment of effort on the part of the U.S. military to plan for limited naval wars with the People's Republic of China on the assumption that these would not turn into all-out war very, very, very quickly. Uh, if, if we have a sustained confrontation with China, and we may uh, well have one, it's more likely to take the form of a Cold War with arms races, uh, proxy battles uh, in areas remote possibly from China, such as Africa, such as Central America. Again, we tend to forget about our own neighborhood, but that's always contested in great power struggles. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I just think that this, uh, and one more point about uh, the South China Sea. During World War II, the United States proposed to give the Dayu Islands, that is the Senkakus, to China, our ally during the war. It would give them responsibility for it. Franklin Roosevelt hoped that China would be uh, the hegemon of East Asia. And in fact, part of his plan for the four policemen, uh, Russia, the British Empire, uh, China, and the US policing the post-1945 war, was that China would be the hegemon of Indochina and replace the French. Uh, since uh, FDR thought American interests would be better served by hegemonic China in Asia than by uh, any European powers, the British or the French. And let's be clear, Roosevelt was a realist. The, the China he was talking about, this was Chiang Kai-shek's China. It was an authoritarian state. I've actually read Chiang Kai-shek's book, The Chinese Economy. It's pretty much like the modern Chinese economy. It's a plan for a mercantilist, state-driven industrialization, uh, which violates all of the rules of neoclassical economics and, and is a developmental state. So. That's just one of the, the paradoxes of our time. The China that we are afraid of, a developmental capitalist state that dominates a East Asia, is what we actually wanted during World War II, uh, uh, when it was simply not considered by anyone, I think, in the 1940s, or even during the Cold War, that the United States would permanently be not a, a major power with interests in Asia, but perpetually the major Asian power. I think it's time to go to perhaps the premier exponent of neoclassical <laughs> economics, which Michael has just derided, Chris Preble from the Cato Institute. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Michael. Um, Michael, as you know, I, uh, I hope you're right that we are at an inflection point, but I uh, agree with Ambassador Burt that I'm afraid you're not. Uh, and maybe this is because I'm too busy listening to people like Robert Kagan and Charles K Krautheimer who say, no, we're not at the end. We are doing fine. So the question is, what piece of evidence would convince them that the time has come to change course? You, you cite resistance from others, other great powers, the unwillingness to resource it here at home, and the resistance from the public at large. Um, there are still some of them who say we could cl clearly resource this without any difficulty at all. We simply raise taxes or cut other spending. You know, Where's the U.S. public resistance? We don't have people marching in the streets as we did after Vietnam. And where's the actual evidence of balancing by other great powers? Can you point to something there? Because it seems to me that we still don't have sufficient evidence 
to convince the other side uh, that it's time to change course. Well, that's a good point, particularly about the other great powers. Now, <clears throat> it was once absor absor observed uh, to me that in one of the crises over North Korea, the closer you got to North Korea, that the more relaxed everyone was about it. Uh, it was actually in Washington where people were much more exercised, you know, than, than in South Korea. Uh, and I think that's the case with Russia. Uh, the Germans have made it clear that they're very dubious ab about another Cold War with Russia. Uh, I read uh, that the Czechs are debating raising their military spending, I believe it's to 1.5 percent of GDP. Well, if this really is a Sudetenland moment and Russia is this great threat that it's being portrayed as, I assume the Czechs would be debating maybe 15 percent of GDP, you know. Uh, we, we had 50 percent of GDP in the U.S. during World War II. They seem fairly relaxed. Uh, if we look at uh, th the neighbors of this China that we're, we're supposed to be so frightened by, uh, China is, th is now the number one trading partner of South Korea, uh, and it's up there uh, among the, uh, the, Japan has increasing trade integration. So I think we have to take all of this with a grain of salt. And one of the dangers of our alliance system is that it enables irresponsible behavior for domestic political reasons on the part of uh, nationalists in Japan and South Korea and not so much in Germany at this point. Uh, but, it, but it allows uh, the leaders to talk tough and, and uh, you know, poke uh, either Russia or China uh, at the same time while profiting from their increasing economic integration. And that's fine. It's sort of a game. I'm from Texas. You know, we have a rivalry with Oklahoma. Oklahoma calls Texas Baja, Oklahoma. You know, so, so you know, but it, it, we, we know that this is not a serious uh, uh, security threat. Uh, uh, so now, in, in terms of what pieces of evidence would convince hardline neoconservatives that the United States uh, does not have a stake in global hegemony. Uh, well, I, I gave up, uh, when, when I left the neoconservative movement, I gave up trying to analyze the hardliner mind. Uh, but I think even they would say at some point that uh, it's clear that the United States is not pursuing the policy they favor. And it would probably have to do with the defense budget. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, Robert Kagan and, and uh, Bill Kristol published an article calling for, was it permanent 4 percent or 6 percent of GDP uh, being spent like on triple defense? Triple. Uh, the U.S. is now, at, at the end of the Cold War, uh, we went down to about 3 percent of GDP, which is respectable. Uh, uh, it's a little more than Britain and France, which are, are, have the greatest military spending Western Europe uh, uh, spend. It's a lot more now. And then it shot up again after 9-11. But under current budget plans, as I understand it, it's arcing downwards uh, to even below 3% uh, in, in the 20, uh, 20s, uh, absent changes. So I think even the supporters of the hegemony strategy would say at, at some point that it just cannot be carried out realistically. Uh, even Now, that doesn't mean you won't still nominally have these alliances with Japan or South Korea. They may last indefinitely. But uh, uh, the other thing that may... Uh, uh, mark a clear break from the present period is if there are enough challenges to U.S. hegemony in Europe, Eurasia, in Asia by Russia and China, and the U.S. backs down enough, that will create a new situation, new facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, remember, a lot of foreign policy is psychological. It's intimidation. Uh, and, and this is why I'm concerned. Uh, that is, I think it's very likely the U.S. will back down again and again and again because of what uh, the Australian diplomat Hugh White calls the asymmetry of, revolve, of resolve. That is something that's very important for them, like Crimea to Russia. It's just not that important for the United States. It's not going to, worth going to war about. Uh, and that's why we need an exit strategy where we need to say, here is our American vision of a Europe that is not divided between American allies and American enemies, and an Asia that's not divided between American protectorates and outsiders. And I think that's how uh, we, we, so it's not seen as backing down or unilateral retreat, but it's seen as building a new order with former enemies. The next question is from James Mann, who has 
written several books on the uh, realists and neocons and, uh, and on the Obama administration and told me he's just completed a short biography on George, a George W. Bush. So. <laughs> Michael, thanks for this. I had one question on something you haven't mentioned, but that I read is in your article, um, which is immigration. And I'd be curious to know how it fits into your um, your thinking and your article, both, and maybe maybe it applies equally to, as to um, low skill immigration paradigm, Central America, and and high skill paradigm, I guess, India. Well, I approach this from the view of strategy in general. If you have a rule-governed global market with relatively free flows of capital and, and if not of labor, uh, then you can have a shrinking population uh, and you're, as long as per capita GDP is going up, then you, your country can get richer and richer. Uh, you know, so that Japan, say, could shrink and have fewer and fewer people every decade but those fewer people would be richer because productivity growth in Japan is going up and, and they're better off. Uh, in a mercantilist world, in a world where some or most powers are treating economics as an instrument of statecraft rather than as a rule-governed uh, uh, zero-sum game, uh, you know, then the logic is quite different uh, because of the high degree of overlap between population and military power. It's not perfect overlap. You have large countries like India, which are relatively weak, uh, and you have uh, uh, small countries, which punch beyond their weight, as Britain has done since the, the Industrial Revolution. But in the long term, as, as uh, productivity diffuses and, and converges among countries, all of things being equal, a country with a larger population is going to be more powerful, both in trade and in the military than a smaller country. Now, this goes, uh, th th that's, that's the geopolitics of it. Uh, what you see happening in the countries of uh, the developed world is a very deep backlash against immigration uh, in the United States uh, on the right and uh, in Europe even more so. Uh, uh, now, partly this is a backlash against a particular kind of immigration, Muslim immigrants, rather than necessarily against others, but in the European case, it's against Eastern European immigrants, too. Uh, you know, having said that, even though, and perhaps this will be my most uh, uh, visionary, uh, counterintuitive prediction of, of this talk, uh, I think that in, in the 21st century, this uh, uh, defensiveness towards immigrants is going to be replaced among many nations, if not all, by competition for immigrants. Uh, which will be seen uh, as a source of GDP growth uh, and also of, uh, of military power, uh, frankly, and, and of a revenue base. Uh, right now, uh, only a minority of countries have population uh, growth rates above the replacement level. Most countries are scheduled to stabilize and then start declining. Uh, it's largely parts of Africa, parts of Central and South Asia, even China, you know, is, is beyond the demographic transition. Now, it seems inconceivable at this point that you could have uh, the major nations of Europe and East Asia become relatively immigrant-friendly. Obviously, there's tensions in the United States, but relatively immigrant-friendly nations uh, the way the United States and some of the other Western Hemisphere countries are. Uh, but I think that if the alternative uh, is loss of, of military security as well as of economic clout, uh, then you're going to see a shift. Uh, and this will be really the, one of the most radical uh, changes in, in world society in centuries uh, because the pattern until recently was that the major countries of Europe and Asia sent people. They didn't import them. Uh, now where uh, the birth rates are, are so low, the only way they can even stabilize their population is by importing people. Uh, at the same time, that raises questions, okay, if you're going to uh, bring in people merely to stabilize your population, much less expand, in order not to deepen divides along ethnic lines within your territory, you need to have assimilation and integration uh, of, of immigrants. Uh, and this is a, a place where maybe I'm, I'm showing my biases here. I think the United States, you know, can uh, had a pretty good model 
uh, at least until recently, of both economic integration and cultural uh, uh, integration of immigrants. Uh, economically, if you have a booming economy and jobs for the middle class and so on, then it's much easier for outsiders to get a stake in society. At the same time, the melting pot idea did not require uh, immigrants to cut off all subnational identities, but we had the hyphenated American. You were Irish American, you were Greek American, you were Jewish American, you were Swedish American. So you, you could have both identities. Uh, this is still quite alien to most of the other industrial nations, and I don't know which way they'll go. What you say makes sense for the United States. I have a hard time seeing Japan <laughs> in this, which for a long time has had low growth, um, and you don't see the impact uh, on changing immigration policies uh, at all. Well, then to the extent that uh, population is a basis for power, they will slip down the world power rankings as well as the GDP rankings, which is not to say that they will be poor. You know, Luxembourg, I think, has the highest per capita living standard in, in Western Europe. Uh, so, so countries may make that choice. Michael, I wanted to ask you about uh, something very contemporary now, which is uh, We've had Bob Kagan's essay in the New Republic declaring that superpowers can't go on vacation. Today, there was an op-ed by Walter Russell Mead, whom you know well, in the Wall Street Journal declaring that America can't go on break and that we're seeing the dangerous consequences of a lack of resolve in American foreign policy in failing to stand up to Vladimir Putin. And Meade's thesis was that Putin is, in a sense, rescuing us from our own sins, awakening us to our bad behavior that we need to reform and uh, buck up, start exercising more vigorously, take a, uh, take a, a much harder stance towards foreign foes. So even though the uh, President Obama, whether you think he's a realist or not, he certainly enunciates realist, some realist themes. There is a real pushback, I think, in, in Washington against the notion of realism in American foreign policy. There's a very explicit uh, denunciation in, in both Kagan's piece and uh, in, in Walter Russell Mead's piece uh, in, and by Charles Krauthammer of the idea that America uh, can, in fact, act more prudently abroad. They, they would characterize it as cowardice and, and defeatism. And many of the things that you were talking about uh, in, your, in your earlier really date back to the Paul Wolfowitz document, document don't they, in uh, the George H.W. Uh, administration when he came out and was slapped down for uh, espousing a strategy after the Cold War in which the United States would retain hegemony in all parts of the world. It seems to me that this consensus uh, may not exist in the American public. And the Obama administration, as I see it at least, is waffling. But the consensus among elites, I mean, uh, it, I'm also, this is also coming to mind because Strobe Talbot introduced Bob Kagan the other day and they had a, a discourse where essentially no one <laughs> really disagreed with what, with what Kagan was saying. It seems to me you do have a consensus at the elite level that whether we call it liberal internationalism or, or neoconservatism or some hybrid, really is still dominant, at least among the, the foreign policy elite. Would you disagree with that? Or? No, no, I think, I think there is this bipartisan consensus. I, I think it will start showing cracks. Uh, but the problem with it now, it's not that uh, it's fissuring. It's, it's still a very solid consensus. The problem is the enormous gap between the claim that we need to show resolve and the actual actions we will take. Uh, so, you know, we have to stand up to Russia over Crimea and Ukraine. 
Okay, so we might send some advisors to a Baltic Republic, right? Well, Putin retaliates against that by eliminating American manned space flight for a decade. It's amazing. It's amazing. The United States no longer has manned space flight capability. We were hitching rides to the International Space Station on Russian rockets. Oh, and it gets better. Uh, the United States doesn't make many of the rocket engines it needs for our own spy satellites, which is just as well because the spy satellite the U.S. is temporarily using to communicate with its African forces is a Chinese satellite, <laughs> right? So on the one hand, we have the leaders of the foreign policy intelligentsia saying we must rule, we must stand up to the Russia and China, and at the same time, they've spent a generation dismantling the American military industrial complex. The United States does not build a single civilian ocean-going ship, thanks to President Ronald Reagan. Uh, from 1930s, uh, uh, under Franklin Roosevelt, all the way up to the Reagan administration, the United States government had a simple policy. Whatever subsidies are offered to civilian shipmakers by other countries, the federal government will match, no questions asked. The Reagan administration came in. We're strong, we're number one, we're gonna win the Cold War. But they decided that this was a, a waste of money, so we would get rid of the subsidies. Consequently, the United States, apart from uh, specialized uh, Navy ships and uh, domestic barges protected by the Jones Act on inland waterways, we have to buy all of our ships, all right? So that is my answer to, to all of these uh, triumphalists. You know, Teddy Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. He didn't say, denounce your rivals and ask if you can borrow or buy a stick. <laughs> Aaron Baxian. Uh, from much of what you've said, it seems to me that the best friend a neocon could ask for um, is Mr. Putin, because there was sort of a natural withering away of this overblown role that we were playing at, toward the end of the Cold War. In fact, there was a conversation between senior Bushes, uh, either while vice president or just after becoming president, with Francois Mitterrand, where Bush is meandering around talking about how we've got, a, well, Mitterrand says, it would help a lot if you could explain to me what this new role for NATO is that you're talking about. And Bush starts saying, well, we've got to think in political terms about a new role in this period. He doesn't know. He doesn't have an answer. And Mitterrand, while we don't have an enemy, and Mitterrand said, yes, isn't, isn't it inconvenient not having an enemy? Well, Putin has now basically come forward and, as I say, is the answer to every neocon's dream because he's changed the rules of the game, at least uh, rhetorically, and made it much more difficult for anyone to calmly talk about the sort of standing down of American power. I think that's right, uh, but again, the question is, what are the concrete actions uh, if the United States is going to respond? Now, it would not be a bad thing if this were a Sputnik moment, uh, and the response was, as it was to Sputnik, let's upgrade our education, let's invest in infrastructure, let's, let's redouble funding for R&D, uh, because as I suggested earlier, if you're really going to have genuine great power rivalries, and, and we want to have good great power relations, but we may end up being on, on uh, rival sides, uh, then at the end of the day, the country with the best technological economic base and the deepest pockets in terms of credit is, is going to be able to hold out longer, particularly if you have cold wars, which are primarily wars of economic attrition. What the neoconservatives, and I think many of the neoliberal hawks have forgotten, is that foreign policy has more than one instrument. The military is not the only instrument. Uh, and we've allowed our other instruments to decay by focusing on having Marines in Australia to contain China or, you know, putting some, some NATO troops in Estonia or something like that. I'll give you an example. The United States during the Cold War competed with the Soviet Union in terms of foreign aid and foreign lending. Africa is going to have two billion people by the year 2100. That's right, two billion. Uh, enormous needs for infrastructure. The Chinese uh, are building highways and ports and railroads in Africa, around the, the Indian Ocean and so on. Uh, while we have uh, people on the left and the right in the U.S. Congress trying to abolish the U.S. Export-Import Bank uh, 
which on a much, much, much smaller scale helps to finance uh, uh, infrastructure and manufacturing uh, with inputs from U.S. exporters in the rest of the world, right? Uh, as, as I, you know, if, if you look at what's going on uh, in Eurasia now, this is one of the greatest periods of infrastructure construction in history. Pipelines, a high-speed rail from China potentially to Europe, uh, and Congress cannot agree to come up even with a tiny, modest pilot program version of a national infrastructure bank, much smaller than the European Investment Bank or than the state development banks that are possessed by Brazil, by India, by Russia, by China, by all of these other countries. So uh, I, I don't want to suggest by any means that we should relax and, and that we won't have great power conflicts, uh, but we need to stop thinking in terms of sending divisions here and submarines there. Uh, a lot of the struggle, and we knew this during the Cold War, the Cold War was first and foremost an economic struggle. The reason the Soviets cracked was their economy cracked. And we were so rich and so prosperous and so innovative uh, that for a fraction of the money they spent on the military, we could outspend them. At the height of the Cold War, we spent no more than about 15 percent of GDP. That's how rich we were. That's how Britain won the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, it was much smaller than, than uh, France, uh, but it had better credit and a and, uh, uh, more prosperous economy. Uh, it, it's uh, your example in the world. It's ideological war. It's propaganda. You know, even in the past of a few months, these rev well, this revelation now about the NSA uh, taking faces from the Internet, uh, the revelation that the CIA in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan was using hospital operations as a cover for getting DNA from potential terrorist suspects, in, including Osama bin Laden's family. Uh, this, is, this is enormously damaging, you know, to America's image in the world. So, you know, I, I share some of the concerns of, of uh, mainstream foreign policy establishment with uh, America's power and resolve, but they're thinking in this kind of board game manner where it's just a, like moving troops here and there. And what we need is a conversation, okay, assuming we really do face great power challenges, let's look at every dimension of power, including economic power and, and uh, uh, the power of influence and example, and not simply think it's a matter of, of uh, sending an increasingly whittled down military, you know, as a symbolic presence here or there. Michael, as a... Uh Final question. Let's uh, test those powers of creativity that I mentioned and uh, Ambassador Burke commented upon. It's 2050. What does America look like domestically and what's its standing in the world? Well, there have been a number of studies of, of what the world will look like in terms of GDP in 2050, and they tend to agree uh, that the four major economies will be the United States, India, China, at least in terms of GDP, uh, and the European Union. Uh, and if, if we're looking at the middle of the, the 21st century, it's only a few decades from now, uh, the United States will still be in a very enviable position. It will be the only rich country that's big and the only big country that's rich. So unlike Robert Kagan and, and many of the neoconservatives, I think we're in a fairly secure world. Uh, the United States really does not have to control the South China Sea or, uh, you know, the Priapet marshes of Prussia uh, in order to be a world power. The, the source of our world power is we are the only first world country that is on the scale of India and China, and they will be big and important, but they're going to be much poorer per capita than we are and have less disposable power. And, and the fourth area of ma major wealth, the European Union, I think will, like as today, there will be some mix of cooperation and local sovereignty, and it will not act as an entity in world affairs. Uh, probably by that time, you will have a somewhat uh, more liberalized, mellowed Russian nation. And Russia is part of Europe. It has always been part of Europe. I mean, this, this idea that Russia is not a European country. The next time I hear somebody say Germany is the, Europe's largest country, no, Russia is Europe's largest country. And also, interestingly enough, by 2050, absent some major change in British immigration policy, uh, Britain will have more people 
than Germany. Uh, you know, these things can change as a result of policy. But if you're looking at a large, rich Europe in which the two largest nation states are Russia and Britain, that's, that's somewhat different, you know, from, from this German-dominated uh, Eurozone. Uh, so I think there's reason for cautious optimism. Uh, and the fact is, this is the world that we sought to create in the world conflicts of the 21st century. We wanted China to be free from colonial domination. We wanted India to be independent. We wanted a whole Europe that wasn't divided by an iron curtain. And having achieved it, we're now saying it's so dangerous that, that you know, we, we can't uh, demobilize, we can't pull back, you know, we, we can't uh, uh, abandon anything. Uh, so, you know, maybe what we should do is, is declare victory in the world wars. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael. Having known him for uh, many years, I was able to assure my colleague Paul Saunders here that uh, in some meetings, you know, you get these air gaps where the room sort of goes silent. But I assured him <laughs> that with Michael, there is never a dull moment. And uh, we have barely scratch the surface uh, with his talk, which you may either find uh, daunting or invigorating. But uh, I am very grateful to Michael, both for his cover story and for speaking with us today. Thanks.